All right, thanks for joining us on a Tuesday evening. I guess uh, the next step is Mark and Dreesen or happy hour, depending on what you guys are up for. Uh, let me paint a picture. You've had a successful pivot. Your MVP is working. You found that elusive thing that you've been working your, your, your careers for in, in at least this company that you're in. And everything seems to be working. But that initial euphoria turns. And instead of being smooth sailing to success, you're now managing a massive cultural shift. One that sadly is of your own making and frankly a result of your success. You've added these grizzled veterans to take you to the next level. And that's creating all kinds of tension with the lean startup advocates. The cultural challenges between these two opposing forces is threatening to rip your baby apart. By the way, I'm the grizzled veteran. <laughs> but I'm dressed cooler, so. <laughs> um, interestingly, uh, the story doesn't go as you might imagine. In fact, when we submitted um, this talk way back last summer, I don't think even Neil and I actually understood what we were going to uncover in the course of actually developing our, our ideas behind this. And the story really turns out that there are cultural differences and there can be and will be cultural differences, but do not let that cover up or mask the real underlying problems that you need to solve. So in the next 15 minutes, um, we're gonna show you a, a framework that we came up with along with a couple of key concrete things that you can kind of keep in your back pocket upon that day that you have that successful pivot that we had and whip it out and use it to your advantage. So one thing you need to know about um, what TaskTop does, our business is integration. So we've had some very cool talks in the course of these two days with lots of very sexy, cool software. Our software is pretty much the furthest thing from sexy and cool. I don't, never talk about it at cocktail parties. I never say what I do. Um, it's enterprise software. It's big enterprise software. What we do is we um, <clears throat> integrate um, software tools together. So if you think about it, we have heard a number of talks around the importance of network and community. Our network, our ecosystem system isn't consumers, but rather all of the software tools that are used to develop software have to talk to each other. That's what we do. So to give you an idea of what we were facing when we had our successful pivot, we went from an open source software product that frankly the $200 is probably a little rich for our average deal size at the time, to an enterprise software company where the average deal size was $120,000. In the past we were selling to developers and on a good day dev managers. Now we're selling into VPs of apps and QA and CIOs in some cases. The great thing about developers is they want the latest and greatest. They're more than happy to pull down your open source project, build it themselves, and play with it, and then give you great feedback. Uh, in the world of banks and insurance companies and large manufacturing companies, they expect quality and stability. So a pretty major shift from where we had been to where we ended up. And that shift was so successful that we knew something had to change in order to match what our new market was. And what we did was we brought in these very battle-tested, no longer gray-haired, um, zero trouble, you know, brought in these great, great industry experts, people that knew how to sell enterprise software, people whose customers had been the banks and things of that nature, uh, people that looked like what we had suddenly become. And the great thing was we were so successful on the pivot that they actually believed that we could do what we said we could do, and we hired them. Unlike Kent Beck's story yesterday, we talked about how the, you, know, you bring in the grizzled veterans and the lean startup guys leave. We had this idealized version of the world where, hey, let's get the best of both worlds. It seemed like a really good idea on paper. And then this palpable tension set in. Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, this palpable tension set in. Um, the grizzled veterans 
certainly <laughs> thought we knew how to build and execute on enterprise software. And the lean startup guys were saying, but wait a second, we got to this place because of the way we were doing things before. Why are you making us change this? What, what, what is going on? It didn't feel very lean when the grizzled veterans kept saying, literally on day one, mind you, we need to hire some more people. We need QA. We need docs people. We it's need... Like day three. <laughs> Dave was day one. Um, we need some business analysts. We need all of this infrastructure. And whoa now, Nelly, <laughs> y'all need to slow down was the thing they kept saying. Y'all are moving too fast. You need to step back and analyze and, and figure out what we're going to do next and, and think it through. And at the same time, us grizzled veterans would call each other and say, what are these crazy kids doing? They're, they're claiming that we can deliver a feature next week to this huge <laughs> enterprise customer. What are they thinking? And all of a sudden, I felt like I was in this very surreal like cartoon with the bubble coming out of my head. And, <laughs> and it was build, measure, learn to me was more chaos, cross your fingers, move on. Don't worry about the trail of issues that you may have left in your wake. Just keep on trucking. So this shouldn't be that hard, right? We all have the same goals. Um, you know, companies have had cultural problems for as long as, etern as, long as there's been people in companies. Um, we should be able to get everyone on the same page, you know, go out, do some trust exercises, and, and we'll be fine. It's, you know, there's a solution to this problem. What was interesting was something unexpected happened our way, on our way there. Something, honestly, we didn't even know about when we wrote this abstract. The cultural differences didn't match up, didn't line up to what we were seeing as far as what the symptoms were. So what were the symptoms? <clears throat> the most obvious symptom was that the pace of experimentation had ground to a halt. It was ground to a halt. In addition to that, though, what we were finding is that most of our organization was having to spend an inordinate amount of time doing things to keep our customers happy, fixing defects, uh, dealing with incoming support, and so our support calls were increasing substantially as well. And it, it really was beginning to feel just like there was, there was nothing being done with intention, but rather everything was being done in response to the chaos that we were living. And all of these symptoms really were indicators of the true underlying issue. And this was kind of our big aha moment, our first big aha moment, of what was really going on is that we were drowning in our, in our technical debt. And we did an analysis of our velocity, but what we uh, were able to work on before the pivot versus after. And I think this visualization makes it pretty darn clear that something had to give. We could not ignore this technical debt any longer. So again, referencing Ken Beck's talk yesterday, we were dealing with the exact issue he talked about. We needed to be hunters, but we also needed to be gatherers. We had a growing list of customers who were enterprise and had high expectations, but at the same time, we needed to keep, uh, keep experimenting to figure out what that product quality, what that product market fit was gonna eventually look like. What was that ultimate solution gonna look like? One of the challenges here is we think this is actually something that's inherent in lean startups. So the beauty of experimentation is you focus. You focus on one issue and you kind of say, you know what, we're gonna ignore all the rest of the stuff and we're gonna find out if this works. And it's, it's a great uh, you know, a scientific method. It, it's wonderful. But if you have success, all of that stuff you ignored, it, it, there comes a time where you gotta pay the piper. And that was the world we were in. So, you know, so as we, so we said, all right, we've got to fix this foundation. And, and we did, we, we sat down and, and, and we said we had to fix it. And as we were fixing it, as we were starting to put in the, the base that we needed, we had our second aha moment. And it's really a, a, quite, a quite simple aha moment. There are three levers that you control. And what's cool about these levers is that you control them because so much of what's going on in your business, you don't control and there's tons of uncertainty. But these three things, pace, thoroughness, and quality, you control them and you can set those levers 
at different heights and different amounts of focus. And in fact, what we found is that you will absolutely want to set them in different, different positions during the different course of, the, course of your phases. So one thing I wanted to quickly talk about with regards to thoroughness versus quality. So in the course of all of our great experimentation, we had built a ton of features, but we didn't know what they were. <laughs> and that's different than, oh, this feature over here is buggy. So thoroughness is really about understanding what your product has in it and understanding what it does versus quality, which is really about does the thing work properly. So these are the three levers that you have at your disposal. So uh, what we're gonna go through now are three key takeaways with regards to these levers that we learned in the course of our journey. So the first takeaway is chaos is the killer of pace. And this is a pictorial of, of what our levers look like at, you know, at the early stages, at the beginning, right? Pace was everything. You're trying to move as quickly as possible to, to experiment, to find out if this works, and then to move on into your next experiment. Um, you know, and you're, you're trying to minimize the experiments so that, that they don't cost a whole lot, too. Uh, I don't even think we knew it at the time, but thoroughness and quality took a back seat. We realize that now, it's easy to see that in hindsight now, that that's what was happening. Um, so, but that all changed with that success. Once we had that success, this thing felt less like this fast-paced, intentional experimentation, and all of a sudden this reactive, oh my God, we have a sub one coming in, all hands on deck, and, and, and you know, let's try to bail the boat out here. Um, what ended up happening was we had no choice. We had to reassess these levers. This was not the world we could continue in post-success. Chaos, which sometimes I joke is code word for customers, had set in and we had to deal with it. Nicole talked about knowing what you are. I think we didn't actually know what we didn't know. So, and if you don't know what you don't know, it's really, really hard to scale your experimentation. It's, it's really hard to get that feedback loop working. And of course, in the meantime, you're still trying to satisfy the growing customer base. So we took a look at our levers and we said, all right, we're gonna have to adjust, right? The, and I think, again, the pace here is a little generous as far as um, what it was. It, it was close to zero as far as what experiments we could do. But we have to get our quality in place and we had to learn what it is we didn't know. We had so many experiments out there. And I know when I read the Lean Startup book, uh, you know, the point of it is you're supposed to learn things from your experiments, not create gaps in your understanding. The frightening thing is I don't think we were alone in, in, in kind of being having experimentation out of control. So we wanted to just spend a little bit, um, a couple minutes talking in a bit more in depth when we realized that we needed to set these levers differently um, and build this foundation for experimentation, what did that mean we really did? And this was probably the most painful part, if I recall correctly. It sucked. <laughs> it sucked. <laughs> Technical um, term. Yeah. <laughs> we decided um, to halt all new development and spent three sprints doing nothing but shoring up our architecture, putting a plan in place, to address the technical debt and fixing defects, which was really difficult. Um, however, what it then allowed for is we were able to establish a baseline of quality, and that then allows us to now be proactive in our quality management. And of course, along the way, we also then removed a lot of the customer dissatisfaction because all of a sudden our software was working um, far better than it was before. And so that's how we addressed the quality bar. That's how we moved the quality bar up. Now, for thoroughness, what we did is we decided to create what we affectionately call our integration factory. So what we did is we said, you know what? We are going to define, and it turned out to be 63 of them, we are going to define what a standard integration looks like. And that affords us now, when we um, want to experiment and say, let's build an integration to this new tool or this other tool, we can consciously say, okay, I'm going to pick four of those use cases and we're going to experiment. Now, meanwhile, at the same time, and I think this was also the really tricky bit, is that we were 
doing all of this, trying to figure out how to be able to experiment again, while our customer base was growing significantly. And so we had to have this foundation that helped with that as well. And so the integration factory, in addition to letting us uh, experiment easier, also we have this huge automated test farm that's part of this, and it continuously runs. And when a problem is going on with one of our integrations, we know about it ahead of time and can act on it before a customer gets to it. So our marketing people said we can only say three sprints for fixing technical debt. Um, so just truth be told. Um, That's what I remember. <laughs> so really, this brought us to a kind of a, a new period of time, a new phase in, in how we thought about our levers. And the one thing that you know we now understood what success, <coughs> success had changed things. We also now understood it had a foundation in place. And at least for us, and I know this isn't going to be right for every business, but for us, that quality bar was critical. That had to be in place. There was no option whatsoever. Um, you know, when you think about your levers, you'll need to think through, are, is that the right situation for us? Once we understood we couldn't give on the quality bar, we had to come up with some additional tactics. The, I love the Lean Startup book. Those tactics didn't work for us. We had to come up with new ideas to run experiments because the quality bar was so high and the cost to produce and hit that quality bar was so high. And actually in the talk yesterday, um, I think it was yesterday, the GE one, um, where they talked about how when you're dealing with um, a refrigerator, the cost, the barrier to entry and the cost to experiment is, is significant. And everybody looks at us and says, but your software, it's nothing, it's cheap. But the problem is, is that we can't go to a big bank who just spent a good chunk of change with us and say, we're just gonna stick this in, even though you only release twice a year, just let us stick this in to your production environment and let's just see how it goes for, for a little bit. And, and let's get some feedback. We'd like to have some feedback. That, that was not gonna fly. So we came up with what, what we call pseudo experiments. <clears throat> and what that is, is that we um, will take a sprint if we wanna, um, build a new integration, and we will do the analysis of what that tool actually does. Spend a little bit of time um, gaining a little bit of knowledge so that we then can go to our field and say, all right guys, go find us four or five customers that are potentially interested in this, in this new integration. And instead of us demoing to them, we do what we call a reverse demo. And they show us how they use the, that tool what integration they'd like to see and why, and we are armed with enough business analysis knowledge to be able to ask the right questions. So we still get that fabulous feedback loop very quickly and at a very low cost before we go in and start building. We also do what we call um, Uber demos. Um, and Uber demos, uh, what's great about experiments is they're very targeted and very precise. Um, but a lot of times what we have found is that Customers also need to be shown the larger context and the larger picture of what your product does in order for you to get uh, good feedback. And so twice during every release cycle, so it's every six weeks, um, we do a cross-functional uh, Uber demo where we get a bunch of customers and do um, as many features as we can so they get the context and they see, um, they see all the individual features with, with, the, other, with the other features. And so this is what we call pseudo experiments, and, and, and we still do it today, along with real experimentation as well. So in conclusion, the question we ask is, can lean startup advocates and Brazilian veterans work together? We believe the answer is yes, if you create a, a vehicle for which they can talk and communicate with each other, and if you put the foundation in place. Um, it's absolutely critical to service your customers, as well as support experimentation with that foundation. And then keep in mind that you need to understand and use your levers with intention so that you can find a balance. So I know we ran over a little bit, so I guess one or two questions, one question. And you can always send us questions other ways and we'll be around. Because everyone wants to get to happy hour. <laughs>